Hello class. Uh, today in this lecture in our second unit of week two, we're going to be talking about central themes in Old Testament theology. Um, if you want to use a great resource uh, to understand more about each of these themes uh, and to explore themes in biblical theology in general in a more detailed manner, you might want to check out the book uh, that's edited by Scott Haithman and Paul House called Central Themes in Biblical Theology. So a uh, pretty easy title to remember just based on our lecture title, Central Themes in Biblical Theology, and that's edited again by Haithman and House. Uh, and really, these slides are based off of that book, so you know I really would encourage you to, to check that book out if you want to dig deeper into these themes here. So, first of all, there are what I'm going to call content-oriented themes. Uh, and as the title suggests, these themes are related to the content of particular biblical books or of a particular canon, in this case the Old Testament. So, the first way to organize content-oriented themes is systematic or doctrinal. Um, Charles Scobie has a book uh, called The Ways of Our God, and it's a whole Bible, biblical theology, and, and he organizes it sort of like this, where it's uh, organized around God, God's people, um, so Israel and the church, God's ways, ethics, and then salvation. Um, and in each of those, what you'll see is that they're related to a particular systematic category. So theology proper, ecclesiology, ethics, which might be a subset of ecclesiology, but ethics. Um, also the law would be included here. And then soteriology. Uh, you know, you, you notice, and in Scobie's scheme, this is evident, uh, so, some things are missing. So eschatology is not here, although certainly if you're not going by Scobie's uh, rubric, you know, eschatology could be something that you use to organize an Old Testament theology. Uh, homartiology, the doctrine of sin, is not included here. Um, doctrine of creation doesn't, I mean, you know, you can fit these things into, into some of these four categories, but to really give them their own category would require moving away from this fourfold scheme that SCOBY promotes. So in, in any case, the point is that uh, some content-oriented themes, some content-oriented appro approaches are organized using systematic or doctrinal categories. And like I said, you can use SCOBY's approach or uh, you could use something else. Just, I mean, like you could take, you know, Theology of the Church, by, edited by Danny Aiken, and use the categories in that book to organize an Old Testament theology. Uh, the difference would be that whereas a systematic theology is trying to, like we said in, in the week one lectures, take all of the data from all of the Bible and place it into one circle and organize it, biblical theology, or an Old Testament theology in this case, when it's talking about, say, the doctrine of God, is just looking at, first of all, the Old Testament, and then it's tracing uh, the thought about the doctrine of God, you know, sort of using the narrative structure of the Old Testament to do it. So it's not, it's not just doing systematic or doctrinal theology in the Old Testament. It's not the same thing as doing systematic theology, but it's using systematic categories to do biblical theology, or Old Testament theology in this case. Uh, the second way would be to organize content-oriented approaches uh, would be topical. And I've mentioned uh, Jim Hamilton's book a number of times already. Uh, this would be the central theme approach where you're looking for one theme and you're trying to trace it through uh, each of the Old Testament books. Uh, G.K. Beale, on the other hand, who I've discussed a lot as well, uh, uses an, uh, what he might call a narrative theme, uh, even, because eschatology is a theme, but it also is what drives the narrative forward. It's, we're always looking towards the future. 
in the Old Testament. And so eschatology is this narrative theme uh, that we can talk about that could be used to organize the Old Testament theology that you're working on. Uh, so in this case, you would say, okay, um, how is Genesis eschatological? And then how is Exodus eschatological? How is Leviticus eschatological, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, for those of you who are used to uh, only looking at Daniel and Revelation for eschatology, that might be somewhat of a different approach. But nevertheless, uh, the, the entire Old Testament is eschatological, and you, you can use that thread to trace uh, through the Old Testament. And then, you know, you could, instead of having a central theme that you're always looking for, so one theme, you could have many topical themes. So you could trace the temple through all the Old Testament books in your Old Testament theology, and you could trace the theme of God's servant, and you could trace the theme of sanctification, and you could trace the theme of the image of God, and you could trace the theme of family. I mean, you, you could take a whole number of themes and trace them through uh, the Old Testament in, in the way that you do your Old Testament theology. Now, uh, let me just stop right there and, and say this. Um, with any of these approaches, whether it's systematic or whether it's topical or even when we get further on in the lecture, whether it's oriented towards shape or whatever, um, people are going to pick at your method. So if you say, what I'm going to do when I work through my own Old Testament theology, my theology of the Old Testament, I'm going to pick a central theme and show how that theme is central to each book. Your method is going to be questioned. If you say, in, the, in that instance, if you say I'm going to pick a central theme and I'm just going to trace that theme through every book of the Old Testament, somebody's going to say, wait a minute, why that theme? Why are you picking that theme and not another theme? If, it's, if you're picking it as a central theme, then you're really already, you're not even proving anything by showing it's in each book because you're assuming that it's the central theme before it starts. Uh, sort of similarly, uh, in terms of topical themes, if you say, I'm going to use temple, God, servant, sanctification, family, and the image of God. Those are the five themes I'm going to trace through each book. Somebody's going to say, why those five themes and not other themes? I can think of five other themes that you could have talked about. Why those? Uh, and then with the narrative approach, people might say, yeah, each book is eschatological, but aren't you skipping over a number of other important themes by just focusing on eschatology? So, I mean, there's a number of criticisms to be had here. I mean, uh, with, with systematic or doctrinal approaches, it's the same thing. Aren't you leaving off some things? Isn't using these categories coming to the text, assuming something about it, instead of letting the text itself show you what the themes are. Uh, so, I mean, there's a number of different criticisms uh, that we could bring up here in terms of how you choose a theme or themes, and then how that affects how you read particular books. I'm giving a big uh, shout out to my alma mater here, Southeastern. Uh, if, you, if any of you go on to do further master's work, that's not uh, provided by OVU, or if you decide to do a PhD, go to Southeastern. Uh, so, <clears throat> shape-oriented themes. These are themes uh, that are dictated, determined, fleshed out based on the order of the material, particularly the order of the books. So, Two instances of this. Uh, one is the, a book you're reading, Stephen Dempster, Dominion and Dynasty, and I, I think you're reading that, starting to read that this week, or maybe next week. Uh, and then my book, uh, Christ and the New Creation, which is a trying to take a similar approach with the New Testament. So Dempster's book is uh, trying to do a biblical theology of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, uh, whereas I'm trying to do a, a biblical theology based on the order of the books in the New Testament. And essentially, uh, what, what's happening here is you're saying, and we're going to deal with this more uh, in, let's see, did we deal with, I think we dealt with this actually in the previous lecture, 
uh, in terms of, of, con of context. Uh, so I'm not going to belabor this point. Go back and look at that lecture um, on context. You know, what, what we're looking at is the order of the books. How does the fact that Ruth in the English Bible comes between Judges and Samuel, whereas in the Hebrew Bible it comes between um, Proverbs and Song of Solomon, how does it affect how we understand the biblical theology, not only of Ruth, but of the entire corpus that it's in? You know, when Ruth is between uh, Samuel and Judges, there's a particularly strong Davidic element to the biblical theology of the history books. And Ruth sits right there with Ruth 4, you know, uh, she gave birth uh, to Obed, who gave birth to Jesse, who gave birth to David. So there's a strong link to David uh, at the end of Ruth, and that fits quite nicely in with judges looking for a king and Samuel providing a king in David. Uh, on the other hand, when uh, Ruth is between Proverbs and Song of Solomon, you still have the Davidic element because you it's, it's actually transferred to Solomon. So you've got Davidic son uh, emphasis with Solomon because Solomon uh, writes much of Proverbs. Uh, he is traditionally the subject of the Song of Solomon and perhaps its author. And then Ruth situated between there's still a Davidic element because David is Solomon's dad, but you also have this now focus on the virtuous woman, which Ruth is a concrete picture of, a Gentile woman, in fact. Um, so when we look at shape-oriented approaches uh, to biblical theology, the first kind is canonical shape, and it's looking at how does the order of the books affect which themes are prominent in those Old Testament books. So how does the how does the order of the books affect which themes are emphasized? How does the order of the books affect which themes are emphasized? Not putting new material there, not taking away any material, but just sort of bringing to light, emphasizing certain themes over others based on where the book is placed. Uh, the next shape-oriented approach is actually more historical shape, so tradition history. It is focused on the historical development of theological thought rather than on the shape of the biblical text. We've talked about Gerhard von Rod a few times. Uh, he is the example in Old Testament theology. He's trying to um, <clears throat> trace the history of the Old Test of Old Testament thought, and really not even of Old Testament thought, of what's behind Old Testament thought, that is Israelite religion. He's trying to trace that tradition. So the example we've, we've come across over and over is so the supposed development from polytheism to monotheism. Uh, Oscar Kuhlmann is the example in the New Testament. How, how do things... Uh, progress in terms of Christian tradition to a synthesis of what we now know as uh, Christian thought today. So it's focused on the develop the shape of the history behind the text rather than on the shape of the text itself. And then finally there are perspective oriented themes. Uh, perspective oriented themes are ones in which the presuppositions of the reader are given prominence. So, for instance, um, the easiest one, I think, to understand in this is ideological. Um, from an ideological perspective, and let's take the ideology of feminism. From a feminist perspective, how do we read patriarchal texts. Okay, so in other words, how, I'm a feminist, I'm not, but let's say I am. Uh, let's say I'm a feminist, and I'm coming to the, a, a text like uh, Laban and Jacob, where Jacob works for a particular woman for seven years, and is, and her father, 
actually makes him marry her sister first, unbeknownst to Jacob, um, and then makes him work another seven years for Rachel, the woman he wanted to marry in the first place. Um, a feminist would come to that text and say, wait a minute, what you have here is a, is is two women being bought and sold without their consent. Um, Leah is forced to sleep with Jacob, even though he doesn't want to, on their wedding night, etc., etc., etc. And so a feminist would come to this text and say, how do we approach this from the ideology of feminism? Um, similarly, evolutionary readings... Um, how do we approach this from, from a Darwinian perspective, so Genesis 1 and 2? Uh, you know, so there are a number of ideological things that you can do, you can bring to the text. Now, the, I don't think that's warranted. Um, I think ideological readings are putting something onto the text that the text never meant to constrain it. Um, what should happen instead is when we come to the text, we should be so aware of our own presuppositions that we allow the text to confront and perhaps change them. So in other words, instead of a feminist coming to the text and saying, how can I read this even though I'm a feminist, perhaps a feminist should come to the text and say, how can I read this and let my feminism be confronted and perhaps changed. And that's true for all of us. I mean, we all come to the text with presuppositions. Some of them end up being biblically warranted. Some of them end up being confronted by the biblical text. Um, so when you come to the text of the Bible, you are going to approach it from experience, so the existential perspective. I'm, I'm coming to the text... Uh, in my experience, and you're going to hear this all the time in today's culture, especially with uh, the issue of, of same-sex marriage. Um, you know, I'm an example would be if someone comes to the text and they say, "I identify uh, as I identify with same-sex orientation. I, I want to be married to somebody of my own sex," and and I'm coming to to the text. Uh, with that understanding of my experience, and it cannot be challenged. It's a presupposition that cannot be challenged. And so how do I read Romans 1? How do I read Leviticus 18 and 19 and 20? How do I read 1 Corinthians? Um, and the, the, the answer many times for presuppositional readings is, my presuppositions win over the biblical text. My experience is, it, it trumps what the biblical text says. My ideology trumps what the biblical text says. Instead of saying the biblical text should confront my experience, the biblical text should confront my ideology. Um, there are also sort of less bombastic presuppositions that we can bring, uh, namely literary, critical, and historical. So for literary, critical, what we're talking about is uh, I'm coming to the text with particular ways of reading that I've learned from literary criticism, so rhetorical criticism, structural criticism, uh, these kinds of tools that you would learn uh, from an English degree. And I'm going to come to this text and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the text in light of those tools and using those tools. Um, sometimes this can be very beneficial. Uh, so sometimes literary criticism can help us notice different literary devices that texts use. Uh, sometimes literary criticism can help us see relationships between texts, like intertextuality. Uh, sometimes literary criticism can help us to see nuances in the literary material that we may have missed before. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes literary criticism can be overly enthusiastic about seeing breaks in the text or divisions in the text uh, that, you know, that then lead people to say, well, wait a minute. That must mean there, this used to not be one book. Or, wait a minute, that, you know, th this must mean that this portion of Genesis has a different author, author than this portion of Genesis. So once again, literary criticism, if we don't 
um, allow it to be checked by the text itself can, can lead to some bad conclusions about the text. And then uh, historical presuppositions come into play. Um, you know, it, when you're talking about reading uh, within a historical community, um, you know, so historically African American community, historically, you know, um, Hispanic community, how do we read the text in light of, of our lived experience and history? Uh, and again, the same thing can be said here. These can lead to insights into the text because when, when we hear people from different perspectives read the Bible, many times they see things that we don't. And that's a good thing. S uh, many times also, though, presuppositions can again um, lead to bad interpretive decisions. And this is no less true of the historical presuppositions than it is of the others. Uh, so that's a little bit about presuppositional biblical theology. Um, in terms of discerning themes, so I think this is the last thing we're going to talk about. Uh, in terms of discerning themes, you know, in fact, before we do that, let me, let me just pause here. We'll pause one more time at the end. Let's just pause here for a moment, and I want you to think about um, which of the content-oriented themes makes the most sense to you and why. Okay, so hopefully you did take a moment to think about that. Now we're going to talk about discerning themes. First of all, you can use literary tools. For instance, word studies. Um, you know, Andreas Kostenberger, and I think it's uh, I think it's in his Baker commentary on John. Uh, he talks about how to discern themes, and one of the ways is, is using word clusters, repetition of words over and over in a book. If you see a word happening that's not the or a or, you know, something very common uh, and it happens over and over, you know, the word light. The word light happens a lot in a book. Well, maybe it's a theme. Um, that's not always true. Just, again, just because a word happens a lot doesn't mean it's a theme. But uh, typically the biblical authors, you know, are, are unique individuals and, and they have things that they want to emphasize in their books. So... Um, if a particular word happens over and over again, a phrase, you know, so for instance in Judges, um, the people did what was right in their own eyes, I mean, that's definitely a theme. And it's a cluster, a word cluster that happens over and over. It's a repetition. Or if you see, I guess I should distinguish these, repetition would be something happen over and over. A word cluster would be something, a, a cluster of the same word in one particular area of a book. You know, so for instance, in James 1, you have testing over and over again in chapter 1 and into chapter 2. So repetition of words, in particular if they're repeated in a close proximity, word clusters. Uh, secondly, intertextuality. Um, so I think we, we discussed this in the context um, lecture, but I'll just go over it again briefly. A, a biblical author can repeat themselves. So within the book, uh, intra-textuality, so think about in, inter and intra-states. Intra-state is a road that is only within the particular state. So intra-textuality is the repetition of words in a book. Intertextuality is the repetition of words between books. So both of these things uh, help us to discern themes. If a biblical author is quoting himself over and over again or is quoting another book over and over again, and that links that book to particular content elsewhere, whether it's in the beginning of the book you're reading or whether it's in a different book. Uh, so that will help you discern themes. And then also keywords. And again, this is not necessarily the same thing as repetition, um, but keywords often are repeated. Uh, but, but things like propitiation and Romans or... Uh, you know, um, judgment in Revelation, something like this. Uh, keywords help us to understand themes. So that's that's literary tools for word studies. And you also have narrative threads. Uh, it should probably I should probably have reversed these points a little bit, but um, you know, th there are often stories within particular corpuses of book. Uh, of, of testaments. So, uh, 
the Pentateuch tells a story. It tells the story of Adam to the plains of Moab. And that narrative can help you discern themes. Uh, one theme that I can, and this is true also of Israel's story, which continues after the Pentateuch into, into the end of Second Kings, and then after the exile into Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, particular theme of both the Pentateuch and then also the former prophets and also even into the writings. So all of Israel's story plus those corpuses is Israel's failure to obey. Adam doesn't obey and Israel doesn't obey. Abraham doesn't obey. Moses doesn't obey. David doesn't obey. Solomon doesn't obey. The whole nation of Israel doesn't obey. And so that's a theme that we see through the narrative. And then you also have the meta-narrative of the entire Bible, which again, go, go look at the context lecture for more on that. But you know, the story of creation, fall, redemption, and, and restoration, new creation, uh, that helps you discern themes as well. Uh, canonical shape, we've discussed in this lecture and also in the context lecture. So I'll go over this briefly. Uh, you can look at the shape within a book. So how is a particular book structured? Uh, are particular passes, passages juxtaposed to one another? Um, so for instance, in Genesis, in Genesis uh, 37, we are introduced to, or Genesis 36, we're introduced to Joseph. Uh, but in Genesis 37, sorry, Genesis 37, we're introduced to Joseph. Genesis 38, the, the narrative shifts back to Judah and to Judah and his sons and uh, the, Judah sleeping with his daughter-in-law and producing twins and all this sort of weird sexual perversion. And, and you kind of go, wait a minute, why, why do we get Joseph in 37 and then this weird story in 38? And then it's not commented on at all from there on. From there on, and it's just Joseph again. Why? Why do we have the beginning of the Joseph narrative, and then this weird story, and then the rest of the Joseph narrative? Well, I would say that's because the author wants us to remind us that even though the Joseph narrative takes up the remainder of the book of Genesis, what we need to keep our eye on, and this is what Genesis 38 reminds us of, what we need to keep our eye on, is the seed of woman promised to Adam and Eve, who is through the line of Judah, not Joseph. And so even though Joseph's, uh, even though Judah's story is full of sexual perversion and deceit and sin, uh, it is through all of that that the seed is produced that will bring the Messiah. And so the structure within the book is important uh, to understand particular themes. Uh, if you're looking between books, the end of a, a particular book and the beginning of another book is important. Um, so, for instance, uh, in the Minor Prophets, um, you know, you have Hosea ending with the salvation of the nations and the restoration of um, grain and oil and wine. And then in Joel, those things are judged in Israel. Uh, you have the end of Amos, again, where the nations particularly... Uh, the nation of Edom is saved, and in Obadiah, the nation of Edom is, is judged. So, I mean, what's going on there? Why are, why are the end of these books linked to the beginning of the next book? Uh, and then, within a particular corpus, uh, so the beginning and end uh, of particular corpuses. So, the, the prophets, for instance, uh, in the Old Testament, there's the Pentateuch, the Prophets, and then the Writings. Uh, at the beginning and end of the Prophets, you have uh, Yeshua, Yeshua, uh, Joshua, Isaiah. Um, and then you, you also have Hosea there at the beginning of the Minor Prophets. So you've got this repetition of salvation uh, in the beginning and end uh, of the Prophets. Uh, and you can have just juxtaposition of particular books. So... Um, Again, the minor prophets would be a good example of that. Judgment, salvation, judgment, salvation. And then finally, between corpuses, you can have links. So uh, there are scenes between the Pentateuch and the former prophets, namely 
Deuteronomy 34, Joshua 1, highly similar in language. Likewise, uh, Joshua 1, Psalm 1, the beginning of the writings, highly similar in language, linking those two corpuses together, linking Joshua, the successor of Moses, to Psalm 1, the, the, the wise man who, who uh, does what is good, who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. And then all three of those are linked to Malachi uh, 3 or 4, depending on if you're reading in the Hebrew or the English, uh, the, the messenger that is to come. And so the, the law, the prophets, and the writings are linked together. And so all of these things emphasize certain themes. They play a part in helping to us to understand the shape of the Old Testament and therefore understand uh, the themes of the Old Testament. There's also theological tools that you can use. Um, Sachkritik is a German word that means content criticism. And it can be either doctrinal or ontological. Doctrinal meaning um, you can go to the text. And this is sort of related to content-oriented themes and using systematic categories. You can go to the text in a doctrinal fashion and say, uh, this is what the Bible is about, and I'm going to look for it. So in other words, um, you're not using, you know, you're not going through each book of the Old Testament and looking for all of the systematic categories. Instead, of, instead, you're taking one doctrinal category and you're saying, this is the overall meaning of the Bible. I'm going to look at it. Uh, ontological is looking more at the nature of Scripture. What is the Bible? What is it doing? And therefore, what is it about? What's the content that I should be looking for? Uh, so Brevard Childs is, is the, the famous proponent of this, and I, he rightly says, um, uh, Scripture is a Spirit-inspired testimony to Jesus Christ, because in Christ we see the Father. Now, Childs is wrong about the inerrancy of the scriptures. Um, he, he unfortunately follows Bart here in terms of separating witness from inerrancy, uh, witness from revelation. Um, the scriptures are the revelation of God in Christ, in the text. In other words, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit inspires the text of scripture inerrantly, without error, to show us Jesus Christ, who then shows us the Father. Jesus is the image of God. By seeing him, we see the Father. And so the Spirit inspires the Scriptures Christologically. That they're Christ-centered. That is what they are. That, that is their being, their ontology. They're there to testify to Christ. And so Socrates here would say, look for Christ. Look for Christ in the Old Testament. That's what we should be looking for. Uh, and then you have the hermeneutical spiral, um, which is what we were talking about earlier. Instead of just coming to the text with presuppositions, you come to the text with your presuppositions, but you allow them to be confronted by the text and then apply those confrontations theologically. And, and what happens, it's a spiral because you keep coming to the text, you keep getting refined, and you're spiraling towards a proper understanding of the biblical text. Uh, so, for practical purposes, what are some major themes? Uh, God's place is a major theme. So, the location of God in, in Genesis 1 and 2, he's in the garden with Moses. Well, with, with Israel, he's uh, in the, the fire and uh, the smoke that rests on the tabernacle. Uh, with Solomon, the temple is built. Um, and then in Jesus Christ, he is with us in our flesh. Uh, God's people is a major theme. So moving from Adam and Eve to Abraham to Israel... Uh, to Jesus Christ, to the church. And then God's servant, um, 
God's suffering servant even is a, is a major theme in the Old Testament, and God's holiness as well, so who God is. So who God is, where he dwells, who he dwells with, and who he's using to save. Um, we've, we've talked about this already in terms of examples for canonical shape. Um, Song of Solomon in the Hebrew Bible comes after uh, Ruth. You know, instead of just being sort of a Christian Kama Sutra, uh, Song, of, Song of Solomon in the writings is sort of this pinnacle of the wise and virtuous king marrying the virtuous, strong woman uh, in the garden. They're in a garden. Um, and there's all kinds of messianic language here. There's all kinds of temple language here. There's all kinds of lady wisdom language here. There's Solomon, Davidic son language, etc. All of it is just fantastically bringing together all of these themes from the Old Testament. And so it's sort of a pinnacle, a poetic pinnacle of Old Testament hope. And I think we miss that if it's clumped in with with wisdom literature sometimes. I mean, I don't think it's not, it's, it's not that that's, that language disappears when it's clumped in with little wisdom literature, but when it's in the writings, right after Ruth, right after Proverbs, where we're looking for this wise man and virtuous woman, we can see that this is the poetic culmination of what Israel is looking for. And so what I want you to hear there is, um, you know, hearing those themes, so temple, there's temple language, and by the way, let's bring up intertextuality for a minute. It's intertextually linked to um, 2 Kings 7, where Solomon builds the temple. So there's intertextuality that helps us see a theme, the temple. There's Davidic language, there's Lady Wisdom language, there's Garden language, there's eschatological language, there's intertextuality with Psalm 45, there's, there's the, the place of it in the canon, so, so what we're doing is we're seeing where it is in the canon, we're seeing how it's related to other books in the canon, and we're listening for themes that are recurring over and over again in the Old Testament to understand the book. And all of that together helps us to understand the book as a poetic culmination of Israel's hope. And we'll talk more about Song of Solomon when we get to the writings in, in the later part of the course. So that's, that's just an example for you. Um, likewise, Judges. Uh, if we're talking about Judges, um, again, we've, we've discussed a little bit the repetition of the saying, um, they did what was right in their own eyes. That helps us to see a theme throughout the book of Judges. Uh, it, it's buttressing against Samuel in the Hebrew Bible. Um, helps us actually to understand Saul as a king. Um, because the people clamor for a king so that they can continue to be like the nations. And God gives them a king like the kings of the nations in Saul. Um, Saul is a Benjamite, and at the end of uh, a Benjaminite, and at the end of Judges, the, the tribe of Benjamin is notoriously bad. Um, and, and so those two books buttressing up against one another Help us to understand the theme of kingship, the narrative of kingship, and the hope of kingship in David and then ultimately Jesus Christ. So hopefully um, walking through those two books just a little bit, we'll walk through them more uh, in the later part of the class, but just walking through those just a little bit hopefully helps you to hear how you might discern themes in particular biblical books. Uh, so as, you, as we end this lecture again, after we end... You know, I want you to just pause and reflect for a minute on, you know, maybe make a list uh, for yourself on how you would go about discerning themes. What are some of the tools that we've talked about that you think are helpful? Uh, how would you use them? What are some tools that we've talked about that you don't think are particularly beneficial? Uh, what's wrong with them? What are the, what are the uh, cons of those particular tools? Think about that so that when you start to do biblical theology, and particularly Old Testament theology, um, you, know, you know the method that you're using, the stance uh, that you're coming from.